Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Good morning. Uh, welcome to um, Virginia Cooperative Extension Program on um, the Audubon Program in Northern Virginia. And Leslie Paulson is our speaker today. Oops. Thanks for joining us. Hi, um, I'm going to talk to you about birds in your backyard in Audubon at home in Northern Virginia. It's how I got interested in doing more about the birds in my backyard. This is a program where it asks you to consider making your yard a back backyard habitat. So we will go through and discuss some of these birds and what you have to do to have them in your backyard. You all were sent a handout ahead of time, which you can look at, which will help you, because I'm not going to be reading every slide to you, okay? So one of the most important things right now in this area is the fact that the birds are dying from, from diseases they're getting from our bird feeders. Audubon put this out a couple weeks ago. If you find that you can't keep your bird feeders clean, the best thing you could do right now is just take them down. You need to clean them once a week. You scrub them with a, a solution. I, it's in the handout I gave you, but it's basically one part bleach and nine parts of water. I use a big bucket on my deck, like one of those things you, you put weeds in while you're weeding, filled it with hot water and put that in, let them soak for a while. You can scrub them with a brush. The family that's most affected is the finch family. And they've had problems for quite some time picking up salmonella from um, your feeder and it causes them to go blind. But now we're seeing them dying in very large numbers. So please get them clean. And once they're clean, they won't be hard to do every week or so. And this gives you a little, tells a little bit more information about what I just said in the previous slide. Um, if you have the Niger seed in a sock, be aware that if it rains too many times, that is just going to mold. So get rid of that as well and clean up under your feeders also. And, well, and bird baths need to be cleaned as well with the same way, but be aware that any beet bleach solution, if you pour it in the ground, you're gonna be killing insects. This is showing you the plant structure in your garden, where we have trees, shrubs, vines, ground covers, and even um, sedges and rushes, different things that not everyone has in their yard. Each bird picks a certain canopy height to nest at. So we see the taller trees, we'll see the, the hawks, eagles, sometimes swallows, and the vultures. If, you could yard, if your yard is bigger, say maybe a, a half acre or more, you have room for maybe a white oak, which is the best tree you could put in your yard for wildlife. And then there's hickory, pine, and sycamore or elm. And then the mid story, we have things like our American holly, which is a great source of berries for birds, a black gum and persimmon tree, which is a native fruit tree to Virginia. And it, it's fruit, is really well fed upon by birds. And as far as us, if you want to eat the persimmons yourself, the, the ones that taste the best are the ones that are still on about Thanksgiving time when they've slightly dried. When they say cherry trees, they're talking about black cherry, which is a very tall, can be a very tall tree too. And then understory, which is probably what you most of you have in your yards, it, things like dogwood, hawthorn, the viburnums, rhododendron, which can get quite tall if you let them. And then we start having all our berries, blueberry and the different choke berries and hollies. These are such a good food source for wildlife. And then you see too in the mid story, how many different birds live at this height and nest at this height. And then we have understory where you'll find, see the mockingbird and wrens and bluebirds. And things do nest at the ground level as well. And that like we were the robins. 
and juncos, which are here for the winter. There are a lot of good vines to put in your yard. Our native honeysuckle, Virginia creeper, greenbrier, which we consider a, a weed, but is really a good source of food if you have an area where you don't mind leaving it. And then the ground covers for the, like in a meadow area, golden rods and asters are the best of these two. They feed so many different species of pollinators as, and therefore the birds are gonna um, feed after on some of those insects that come from those. And milkweeds, of course, which we all have heard about in the last year are such a good choice as long as there are native milkweeds. And then there's special plants for the wetlands as well. So here we are at our first bird, which is a warbler. There are so many different warblers in this area. I know in my own backyard, I have the yellow rumped warbler. He is such a cute little thing. And if he gets excited enough and, and jumps around in the shrub enough, you'll see the yellow spot on his bottom. They eat a lot of insects during the growing season. But even in the winter months, I saw this little guy go up and down my azalea bush just picking all kinds of, of debris or old eggs from insects off of it. But if you have a multi-layered landscape, you will have these little guys come and feed. They don't go to the feeder as much. They're usually looking more in the shrubbery for something to eat. So here are some of the things, like I said, and this is all on that handout I sent to you ahead of time. But if you can find some of these bushes to put in your yard, it would be great. And you can fight the birds with the blueberries. I lived in Connecticut several decades ago and I was so thrilled when I moved in because I had like six blueberry bushes and I'd have to net them every year. I used, back then they used to have the material that was a lot like cheesecloth. And I'd try to close every hole so the bird couldn't get in there. And sometimes I'd find my golden retriever in there chasing the cardinals out. But you have berries in your yard, you are going to have birds. You can have the sumac. Our native sumac is a gorgeous shrub to put in your yard. It's so beautiful in the fall. And then of course, like the junipers. Again, and the water they need, I have about one, two, one, one two, three, Four, I have five bird baths in my yard. And that is another thing. If you have bird baths, the winter, especially if you put a heater in them in the winter, you have to make sure you clean and change your water frequently. We try to change ours <clears throat> about every other day. In the summer, sometimes more. And they need a good scrub once in a while. You know, for the bird feeders, I gave you a formula on the handout that tells you about nine parts water, one part bleach. But I wanna tell you that when I washed my feeders, I did it on my deck. I had a big like tub and I put, I just brought hot water out and, and I put a little bit of, of bleach in there. But so then I poured it right on my deck. If you're using bleach, you don't wanna be pouring it into your yard or, to, or near where the birds are feeding in the ground because the bleach is gonna kill all the insects in the yard. I don't care how little bleach that's in there. There's other uh, things, products out. I don't know, vinegar might work to a point, but you're probably gonna have to do a little more scrubbing. Here's some grassy areas like they like. And I thought about them yesterday, we were digging um, a variation of our Panicum vir virginiatum out of, of the teaching garden to split it for our a plant sale. But I know I am just now starting to cut things down that I left for the winter because through the month of March, there are still critters living in our grasses. And a lot of them are things the birds might eat as well. So it's best to leave them for a while. And here, this chickadee is in my yard. And last year we were so lucky. We had a clutch of, of chickadees and it, it's always been one, I think, They've been my favorite birds since when I lived in Norfolk and I was sitting on my back deck. And I want to tell you, we lived in a brand new subdivision and there was a brick wall up. My yard was minute, but there were pine trees on the other side of the wall. And I sat there and I had, had 
put seed out and this little guy came and I had a sleeveless top on and landed on my shoulder and I'm sitting there going, okay, that hurts <laughs> because it's amazing how sharp their little claws are. But these birds, in order to raise their babies, they need so many caterpillars. So here's where I start putting in the things about what you put in your yard and on your plants. So say you think you need to spray because you have holes in a plant in the leaves or you see some insect that you're, you think is going to harm you or someone or your plant and you start spraying herbicides and some pesticides. It's not a good idea. I said it's best to live with it. And all those caterpillars, they feed these birds. I mean, they eat a lot of other bugs too. But when they have babies, it's the caterpillars they need. I know last year when I'll show you a picture eventually about everything that was removed from my backyard, but I actually ordered mealworms because I was concerned because of all the stuff they cut down in my backyard and all my neighbors' backyards as who are running a line with me because they were replacing the gas line. So these are, I'm telling you what you can need and how they need shelter. And we were talking about an owl at the beginning and how the owl is eating some really pretty birds, but it's the cycle of the food web. But you need, you can help the little birds by giving them shelter. So if you have a feeder up, please put a shrub with, you know, about, I say 12 feet because that's in a far enough so that a squirrel won't be able to jump from the shrub to your feeder as long as it's baffled. But they need all the insects that live on all your native trees because native trees and shrubs will have the native insects that these birds need. And keep your cat inside if you have one. You'll see later a picture of my cat who loves to go outside, but he has to be on a leash. Here shows you another picture, the white oak I was talking to you about. See the pretty color? They are a big tree. And then tells you where the, these birds nest. And that the, the, the bird um, house that they were in was, this was, was about just about eight feet from the ground. I took this from a presentation Doug Tellamy did. I took a screenshot because I, first, I think it's a beautiful picture. And second of all, it just shows you that one clutch of chickadees. The mom and dad have to find over nine, could have to find as many as 9,000 caterpillars during when, before they fledge. And sometimes they feed those birds for another three weeks after they fledge too. This is on my deck and this is the, the loudest bird in the woods, the Carolina wren. And it's gotten to the point that if I hear him really yelling and I'm on the main floor, I go to see what he is yelling about because often in my yard, I find out they're yelling at a, a, a snake. Oh, that's another story. We'll see if I have time for it. But it, here again, these, these guys eat so many different insects that help you out. So feed them what they want. You know, plant native plants so that they can find all of these different things. Suet, you know, and if you don't want to go the, the seed route, suet is a great way to go instead. All the birds, there are so many birds that like the suet, especially the woodpeckers. And as you start to clean up all your beds, so last week was our first day at the garden and one of our master gardeners who has this crazy leaf blower that she wears on her back and she, she blew all the leaves out of one area of the, the deer resistant bed. And then I said to her, don't, don't, get rid of them just leave them there and I took the lawn mower our push mower at the garden and I just chopped them up twice and then I threw them back in but like I said I when you when she blows them out I'm I hope that a lot of this thing we found a toad under all that mess too Robin probably put it on our website so we left him covered up these show you some of the, um, the smaller trees that they would like. And I will tell you, I was concerned. I heard a talk one time and I've heard two talks since where we were talking about like service berries are such a good source of food and berries. And they're good for us too, if you ever want to take them 
a, a, a bite. They're really sweet. But they tend to get rust if you have any cedar trees in the neighborhood, just like the apples do. And so, but it, it is not harmful for the birds or anything. So not to worry. It's worth planting. And it's, you know, a small tree. It doesn't, it's, it's a shrub, but it really, it's almost like a tree. It's growing habit is a lot like crepe myr myrtle. And it has a better purpose in your yard than any crepe myrtle would. And wrens will nest anywhere. They have scared me half to death because I have um, like little zippered greenhouses that you can buy at the store and put together and I keep them behind my garage. And I really use them more for storing things. I don't want to be in the weather that I have outside in the summer. And I had one fly right in my face one day when I walked over. So I, I left and he went back he had nested in a metal um, pot that I hung on our deck that was like a, a gardening glove. So I didn't clean that pot out that year. Now here are some of the big birds that you will have in your yard. And you need to understand, if you wanna see these birds and they're in your yard, they aren't going to be eating your seed in your suet. They're looking for the birds that come to your feeders. So. If you decide you are having too many hawks hanging around, then take your feeders down. And you could see the feeder in the top picture, um, how I have a baffle on the pole. It, it keeps the squirrels off, though they still sometimes find their way up there. But they're beautiful birds, aren't they? This is the Cooper's hawk. So like I said about the food and their nesting and they'll nest in, in some of the, if you have a larger tree, otherwise they're probably in the woods somewhere near your house. And be aware too that if you have a lot of windows, especially on the backside of your house where they are, you need to do something to break that span of glass. You could, there's stickers you can buy if you go to Amazon or any of the bird stores that they have. I often just put pieces of stained glass up too so that they see them. Though I did have one time a cardinal that kept pounding on the window because he thought the cardinal on this side was real. And here's um, a hackberry, which is a beautiful native tree. And this tells you some more about some of the, the um, trees that they would like. Their nests are pretty big. So if you have one in a tree, you are going to see it. and bluebirds, who doesn't like the bluebirds? I have a lot of bluebirds in my yard and I'm amazed because of, like I said, all, everything they cut down. But I think one of the reasons they really like to come to my yard is because I have so many bird baths and that in the winter time I heat them because I see these birds throughout the winter because they, they come and eat and drink. You can put, if you have a yard that is open enough, you can put up a birdhouse, but if you're, you have a, a yard where there's no open area, they really won't come and nest in that, that box. They like the box to be in the, on the edge of an open area so because they catch a lot of insects on the fly too. And there's a lot of things you can do to help our bluebirds. Uh, if you, I also suggest that if you put up a bluebird house, you want to baffle and then there's special equipment that you can get to put around the hole too. Because I am telling you, years ago in my neighbor's yard, we were sitting and talking and her daughter says, look at that snake. And the snake was coming out of the birdhouse. I went and got it and threw it. But by then he had eaten all the babies. So you want to watch it. And that's another reasons, reason to keep your bluebird house out in the open instead of a place where the snake can sneak up on the birds. Here shows you some of the things you can do with the bluebird house there down uh, both of these things. And you see the snake down there uh, coming up on, on the pole. And the snakes, the last couple of weeks have been waking up. I've seen several already. And then we have this cute little titmouse who's in the same family as our chickadee. And they're cute and they like ins they eat a lot of insects and they'll come and go both chickadees and the titmouse I'll see them come and go up and down in a shrub and and even in the wintertime looking for any leftover either eggs or 
insect carcasses that they can eat, but they like the woodlands and the shrubs. And the wrens are, will go and try to disturb their nest in a birdhouse if you place it too low. So you gotta make sure you have it higher. So again, it's all the same critters are after them than most of the other birds. You can put nesting material out. I have these like grapevine balls where you can shove um, either a, like a paca fur or even dryer lint. You could, you could shove into the hole and they'll come and take it out to build their nest. And they like some place where there's tall vegetation and then a dense canopy above them. He's so cute. And again, deciduous and evergreen forests are what they really do like. And this website here will tell you everything you need to know about putting birdhouses out for birds. So if you just remember nest watch and birdhouses, you'll be able to find it. Now this one's in my backyard too. This is a tohi and they got the neatest song. It sort of sounds like they're saying, come to tea, come to tea, but they whistle. <laughs> I'm not doing well that today, my mouth's too dry. But I often hear them, you know, we talk about if you have, like my rhododendrons are tall in, in your shrubs, you need to leave the leaves alone under your shrubs because they don't need to be broken up. They're doing their job just the way they are. And these birds go under there and you'll hear them throwing the leaves around like crazy, just looking for something to eat. So like the saw bugs, they love those. And they eat a, a right, wide range of uh, weed seeds too, which is good because gosh knows with the crop of bittercress this year, we all got plenty of weed seeds in our yard. So let the leaves accumulate under the trees and, you know, try to have some fruiting bushes for them. Like I said, bushes with berries are great. And if you can, if you have a bush that berries in the fall and ripens, as opposed to the early summer, they're more nutritious berries. And I believe that that's one of the choke berries, but I don't remember whether it's the red or the blue one. And, uh, and pesticides, again, and spraying for mosquitoes, I would think five times over and then decide not to do it because truly you're killing a lot of good things. And the mosquitoes can come from your neighbor's yard, even if you spray in your yard. Here you see a tohi again on the ground under the feeder. They come and just scratch like crazy. And that's another thing besides cleaning your bird bath and your bird feeders, you need to maybe on a weekly basis, clean up all the debris that's that they throw on the ground under the feeder, all those um, hulls from your black oil seed or whatever, because uh, things grow in their funguses. So you just rake it up. And they actually love when you do that, because then they're down to the soil again, and they like to see what they can find in the soil to eat as well. Oh, wait a minute. Where's my arrow? There we go. And here's the goldfinch. Aren't they pretty? And they're starting, they've started, and most of them are gold already. And here he's on, not a native plant. I let some of this stay in my yard because it just, once you have it, you're always going to have it somewhere. This is um, Brazilian verbena. I will say the birds like it. And the one fun thing about it, is the bird will land on it and it's tall. And then you watch the thing flop up and down while they're trying to eat the insects out of it. It, it, it keep, they'll keep young children entertained for a while, but they'll eat the seeds of all different kinds and they of um, trees and whatnot. And they, they do like Niger seed. And if you buy one of those socks, watch it because if you have a lot of rain, then the sock is going to go rancid. I know I threw one out that was, and that's, it's better to buy the cheaper socks and just keep replacing them. So again, you, if you can maybe even consider, I always, I had a neighbor in Connecticut that always planted a thistle and having spent the previous like 
10 years either in Florida or Hawaii, I said to her, Thistle, she says, wait. And I did, and the goldfinch came and just tore that thing apart when it bloomed. It was pretty. So there's a lot of things you can plant that are, are, are interesting for us to watch. Enter, there we go. Again, as you see, keep your good old cat inside. And here is the catbird. In, in my yard last summer, we had a war between the catbirds and the mockingbirds. The, uh, the catbirds were around all winter and the mockingbirds came from wherever and they wanted to be in the rhododendron. And basically they kicked the mockingbirds out. So they're on the side of the house. And it was interesting to see because mockingbirds are such a bully, but, the, but these guys really beat them. And one of the craziest things you could see, which is neat, is if you have bird baths and you watch and get in the right angle, you'll see that when the cat bird eats that on below his tail on his rump, he has a red spot, but they love berries and they love to take a bath. So here again, I'm telling you all that, you know, no pesticides on all these nice berry bushes you put in your yard. And there's, um, you can do the dogwood woods and sumacs. If you have a really big yard, a black cherry is a great tree, but do understand those tree can get upwards of a hundred feet tall. Elderberry is a great native shrub that they just, they love the berries. There is um, a pretty one that a lot of people ball, buy, it's the Sambuca. It's got like burgundy leaves. And it's been proven that if you change the leaf color on a cultivar, the things that usually go to it aren't interested in. So you'd be much better off just planting the straight, straight species elderberry bush. And try not to prune your bushes too often, maybe, you know, before, at the right time that the, that the pruning guides say, which we can give you that if you don't have one, we can tell you the right time to prune anything in your yard. Because, you know, you always remember that often there's birds roosting and sleeping in there. This is the sumac I talked about earlier. It's just gorgeous and actually it's edible. If you take the seeds and taste one in your mouth, it's sort of lemony. I don't know if any of you have heard Ira, I just forgot her last name, Wallace um, speak, um, but she, I did a class with her once in person, it was fun, where she made jelly and tea and she made some biscuits and whatnot that we, so we could eat with our jelly that was made from sumac and it was really good. So here you, the bottom picture, the top picture shows the pileated on one of my old persimmon trees. And what I did is um, one of our master gardeners gave me a cutting from an old, old English rose bush that was her grandmother's. And I didn't know where to plant it in my yard. And I planted it at the base of this persimmon tree. And it does get rose hips on it which the birds like. And I found because it's there that the birds can get in and out of that, but truly um, anyone after them, those prickers, I've ripped shirts on those rose prickers. But the bottom picture, you could see those green worm-like things. From there, 50 feet away from the green worm is all that they cleared, all the trees and shrubs that they cleared out of my yard. And I, like I said, I was so worried that I wouldn't have any birds, but they are still coming. So as long as you still have other things planted in other places in your yard, you're, you'll, you'll do well. But remember too, that if you can po possibly, here's a bird that would like a snag. So if you have a tree that is died and you don't wanna leave it, it's full height because you're worried about it falling. You can bring it down maybe 12 to 14, 15 feet and leave it. And all the woodpeckers will thank you because a lot of wildlife will then come and just peck and get what they can out of that tree and even make their home in it. Here's a couple other cute little woodpeckers that you see. And the others, the red-headed woodpeckers, someone said that they have seen them in this county, I haven't. 
but they are in, I think it was Bull Run Mountain area. And this is the poor thing that the owl, that we, owl's nest that we know about had for lunch one day. But insects are so important to these birds. So again, if you spray, it's gonna be a problem. But again, if you put serviceberry, elderberry, blackberry, blueberry bushes, you'll have a lot of birds. And then there's the hickory and the oaks as well. Okay, here's a pair of rose-breasted grosbeak. Again, this is both from my yard. This is like my main feeder. So a lot of the birds, they get territorial on this. There's two, they can eat on both sides and it has suets on both ends. So they can sit there and just pig out. It's sort of a buffet for them. But look at all, they can eat the, the canker worms. They'll eat, eat tent cal caterpillars and gypsy moths. All of this, these moths that you might think you need to spray for. And if you see like tent caterpillars in your tree and you're worried about it, then just take something, either a harsh, strong burst of water from your hose or a long pole and poke it and let them the, the caterpillars out and then the birds will eat them and they'll be gone in no time. So understand that we in this area get a lot of migratory birds that come each fall and spring going back and forth and we are on the flyway. So if you put out especially clean water for them, it would be great because a lot of them, you know, I, a lot of birds have the capability of flying many thousands of miles, but it doesn't mean when they finally get someplace that they wouldn't like a drink. I know we had a hummingbird as early as almost a good three weeks ago. It didn't stay. It was one that was going on, but they hovered around. I don't know. Maybe they know that I feed them sometimes. So I put my, my hummingbird feeders are out already. So I've got to, the nights where it's supposed to to have a freeze again. So you, if you have one out, you want to bring it in so that if it's glass, it won't break. Here's the female gross beak, not as colorful as her male. And Virginia does have evening gross beaks in part of the state too, so that you could see that one as well. And do understand, especially if they're migrating when there's a lot of winds coming from the south and, and they're strong, you may see birds that you haven't seen in your yard before just because they get blown off a collision. And again, we remind you about the windows. Now here's the, the ruby throat at my native honeysuckle. And they do love that. And, and sometimes that you'll watch them, one hummingbird will go in and then another male will go into the bush and then they chase the, each other out. You notice too that sometimes the, the birds eat the weeds as well, believe it or not, you know, so think about, you know, if you have a certain area you see them eating, you could leave a few plants and just pull them up after it's done flowering or whatever. And these little guys will even eat a small insect. I've seen them open their mouth and catch them right in the air. So remember in the summertime, don't, if you have a, I've seen some of these hummingbird feeders that hold a quart a sugar water. It's not practical. So I always buy one that is much smaller and I never fill it. At the most, I'm, if they're really feeding, you know, at a high intensity, I might make it half. But truly in the summer, you change your water at least every other day and just clean it with hot water because soap residue might stick on, on it and you don't want to make them ill. A good brush in hot water will do it. Here they show them, you know, feeding the babies. They're so tiny. And it's neat that they use spider web stuff, I think. It's nice that nature you puts everything out there to use. Here is a good slide that just shows you all the insects that different birds eat. If you want the list, just take a, a screenshot with your, with your cell phone or with, you know, on your computer itself and you'll have all this. But the, you know, just think these are a lot of the things in your yard you don't want. Look at the chickadees for aphids, white fly, scale. There's so much scale, so many different kinds of scale. I couldn't name them all. 
in um, nut hatches. This winter we had both the black and white and then the, what is it they call it, the red breasted, the, and that you, you know them again by their sound. You can hear them and know they're coming. And there's things that you can do with both Cornell and in Audubon, I think, where you can take classes and somebody is have. I think it's Audubon that is going to have one soon about how to recognize the songs of birds. And here again, we see our little Junko with so many caterpillars in his mouth. If we don't protect our insects, we aren't going to have any of these beautiful birds we see in our backyard. And here's the list of what I was telling you about for trees, some of the best trees that you can plant. Oak willow, black cherry, birch, and there's a river birch that's native. Crab apple tree, as long as you understand if you put a crab apple tree in and there's a cedar near your house, you're going to have apple rust, but the birds will still eat them. And then the blueberry and maple pine and hickory. This is from one of um, Telemi's first book. And so he, he rates not only the woody plants, he shows you the sebaceous plants. And like I said at the beginning, goldenrod and asters are the best things you could be put in your yard. The issue is that a lot of the goldenrods don't bloom until later as the asters. So you can fill it in with things like all, from the sunflower family because there's so many different ones there too. So we have, this is our healthy yard pledge. We used to have people sign it for Audubon at home and now it's they've incorporated it into the application. But we ask that you reduce pesticide and fertilizer use, you plant native species because it has been proven that birds and native insects are, do better in a yard that is 70% native. I always tell our clients, as new clients, I said, try to work yourself up to 50%. And I asked our, after the 70% bit first came out, I sent an email to our, our county arborist and I said to her, biomass, tell me what biomass is. And she explained that in some cases, having a white oak tree in your yard almost is comparable to having 50% native. But it's, it's, it's something that's hard to measure. But if you just, when you have to replace a plant, replace it with a native. Or if you have too much grass, put in a native bed that, you know, that's only native. Pick three different perennials, um, maybe that bloom at different times of the year and, and plant them in numbers. And try to remove in, some of the invasive species. I know, I don't know if it was this winter we had, but I notice I've had English ivy in my yard and I th every time I think I have it, after a year or two, I find it again. Because when we have a lot of rain, old berries that are down there, they come up again. But try to get rid of the ones that are really taking over, like also that the Japanese honeysuckle. But if you do all this, we benefit all the native things in our yard the things we enjoy seeing, butterflies, the bees, and the birds. And if you'd like us to come visit, you can just let us know and we will. And it's, you have um, the Master Gardener email address, and I also gave you the website for Audubon at Home. So remember, clean water, structure in your yard, levels for all the different birds, who like to nest at different levels. And then biodiversity, manage the invasives, and then the things you can do, leaving your down leaves, building a brush pile. So you have all these twigs you pick up after a storm and branches, someplace out of the way in your yard, just sort of layer them, almost like you're gonna build a fire, but of course don't, and different ways so that there's air pockets and holes where things can get in and out. And you can put flower heads and stalks in there too. When you go to cut back some of the tall things, like I haven't cut all my cut leaf Rebecca down yet. If you put up a colorful tomato cage, just stink it in the ground. When you cut those hollow stems, 
put them in there and leave them. And because there, there could very well be insects in there. And that way you can give them time to come out and find the home somewhere else and keep those cats inside. Here again, I just show you this picture again. And if you want a copy of that, just let the help desk know. And this, like I said, we can come to your house. And I always tell people, you do need a clean, perfect yard for a wildlife habitat. In fact, I want the opposite. I want it to have some areas that you leave somewhat overgrown and thick because there's so many bird species that that's what they want to say nothing of our turtles and frogs as well. And then you just need like 10 sanctuary species. And what the list is got, I think over 40 critters on it now. So it's not hard to accomplish that. And you lot to look out, like I said, there's, um, this shows you all the things that kill birds, the cats, collisions, chemicals. And during migratory time, if you have bright lights in your yard for whatever reason, you might want to consider during migration times turning those lights off at night because they're not good for the birds either. And here's my crazy cat. He's listening. He goes outside. He can be outside for two seconds on that leash and you won't have seen a thing and he'll know that there's a salamander right there, which is why he is on a leash and doesn't go outside without one. And these are websites that you all have, and I believe Robin put them in the chat as well. So I thank you, and I can answer whatever questions you might have. So let me take a look. I, we tried to answer some as we were going along. OK. Um, Someone, Laurel has her hand up. There's a question. Oh. Go ahead, Laurel. Unmute and ask. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, so I live in an urban lot. It's only 100 feet by 150 feet. And mm -hmm. the, I have a stand of hemlocks, which I've had bird feeders on. Yeah. But um, I recently um, got the woolly ad adalgi. Um, yes. And I've heard separately that I sh that the birds could have brought it to the hemlock stand. And so now I've, I'm not feeding birds. Um so just wanted to get your thoughts on that, if I can ever return to feeding the birds again. Thank you. You know, I had, I've heard a lot of things about woolly adelgid, but never that the birds would bring it. Though I am reading a book, um, you know, this woman lives in Connecticut, and, and I was in Connecticut in the 80s, and it was horrible. I mean, it was so bad that I had two hemlocks, thank God that my dogs and my kids weren't outside, that my trees were like 60 plus feet, they just fell. I had someone come and spray back then not in, in, with like a fire hose and it, they still, I think the when I sold my house, the next owner took them all down. There's The thing is to get rid of it, you gotta treat them like crazy. And, and I know they're a beautiful tree, but they're not native to this area. I'd have to look and investigate that. I mean, I mean it's, it's very possible. The only other thing I, could suggest is if you put the feeder in, in a different part of the yard, like if they're in your backyard, you put it in the front yard. But I had not heard of hemlocks just have it. It's chronic. It's not it's not going away. It's just something that that it's like cedar uh, apple trees get cedar rust. It's I, I believe so. I, I'm if a bird brought it, it was one bird. It's not every bird. And what do you do? Uh, so how bad uh, is it? I mean, if they're really bad and they're tall, you might want to consider replacing them at some point if you can't live with the woolly adelgid. But like I said, you could try putting a bird feeder in your front yard. But if it's the birds are just playing like that tree, it's not that's not going to work. But I, I can ask somebody. Me, I'll ask Alonzo. I hadn't heard that one. I, I just heard if you want to send that um, question to the help desk at Master Gardener um, at wcgov.org, then Leslie uh, could get back to you after she checks the site. Right. Okay. 
There's a question about cowbirds coming in. Oh yeah, I have one. I have one nesting in a bush right now. I know they have a a, um, a reputation for kicking, you know, okay. putting their eggs in other birds' nests. But I'm one of those people. I know Kelly's on here. Like when we first got our Martin house, uh, the person who suggested we put it up at, at the teaching garden. She says, you got to go in and throw the other nests out. So I would bring it down, look a few times. And I finally thought, I am not doing this. And, and truly after a time, the purple Martins themselves kicked the sparrows out. So as for the cowbirds, I mean, you can chase them off. If you don't want them in your yard, I would just watch what, where they're nesting or, or, and just, you know, go out and chase them away every time you come. But we have a pair right now, but they've built a nest, but they built their own nest. So I'm thinking that is probably what you're referring to. Mother nature is cruel, but yet each species seems to be surviving with what's been going on for many years. But I, I just find it hard to purposely destroy some of the eggs. <laughs> But that's me. <laughs> so, Sheer, that I think you asked this question about getting rid of Japanese honeysuckle and where to put your smaller trees. And, and really sliding those new trees is the most important. You know, if it's an edge species, it needs to be planted on the edge, like red bud uh, and, you know, dogwood, they peek out from the edge of a forest. So really, if you could uh, send that question also to the Master Gardener desk and we... Um, and Japanese, getting rid of Japanese honeysuckle is a good idea. And we can give you, um, uh, it does take a lot of effort, <laughs> but it also may take some chemicals. So we could um, better serve you by giving you a complete answer from the help desk. If you could email mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Yeah, because it's like, they have a name for it. What is it? It's like slash and cut. Like if you make yeah. a slit a, a at the ground, you make a, fresh cut and you immediately have an herbicide that you put, you just paint on it. You're not spraying. You do not spray them. You just, but it's something that's going to take several years doing this. If, especially if it's really established, but yep, we can tell you how. And Linda, Gould, Linda Goulden found a great um, resource for how birds transmit Willie Adelja to native hemlock. Oh, good. And so um, um, you, you guys can uh, copy that uh, link down. Um, cowbirds, oh, we did that. Um, when to stop feeding birds was another question. Well, see, someone else asked me that earlier and it's, you can stop once everything is out if you wish, but it, because for one thing in the summer, your bird feeders need to be washed, you know, for sure more often because of the heat. It's more, but no one, they don't tell you, you have to, they tell you, you know, if you want to, but then when the birds are nesting, some of the birds are, the mother birds are, you know, and is, are coming to feed her. So I often leave it for that reason as well. But if you, if birds are nesting in your, your yard and dependent upon the, they do, they can become dependent on the seed. But it's really more of a personal thing. I would say do it in the winter when they, when they they need the added fuel. But if you, because gosh, it bird seed is expensive. There's no two ways about it. So if you would like, I you could quit now. You find that you have a lot of birds in your yard that have nested. You might consider putting up a feeder, for, just for the mother birds. And like I said, suet's always a great option. Especially because I've, term, I've watched uh, them feeding that so, to their young. So a long-term goal would be to plant for them. Yes. Uh, in the long run and not re have them rely on, on food. Correct. If you get enough, you get enough berries and mm -hmm. leave enough caterpillars from other critter, you know, other insects, even if you don't like the insect, <laughs> the birds will eat them. I don't know the answer to this, Leslie. An alpaca nesting ball? You can buy the... They she sell. Has, she has to know where to put it. I put it like I have it hanging in my dogwood tree. Um, I've. You can put it anywhere they hang out, but you want it 
so that they can see it. You know, if you put, if you hide it. So it has to face a certain direction. No. It'd be in sun or shade or no, what? it doesn't matter. Just so that anywhere the birds are hanging out. So if, if birds um, set in a certain tree, then you can just, I put it there. And it, I know they use it because it disappears. Okay, which which native viburnums would you recommend, Leslie? Oh, probably the straight species, and I can't remember the name of that one. Oh, um, maple, Robin. maple leaf. And yes. I know there's um what is it? There's, Hall. there's like a blue a blue muffin and, and what that, but those are cultivars and they get they are they if, depending upon where you put them, they can get pretty big. You know, we have them at the teaching garden. Mm -hmm. But if if you can, if if the leaves are the same color and the flowers are the same color on a cultivar, then it's it's safe that they'll still come to that one. Mm -hmm. So Plant Nova natives, if you yes. go, that's a site, um, they have a list, they have a nice color um, guide and they have native viburnums in that. Uh, and again, you're better with the straight species, right? Yes, yes. there's one that's in, yeah, the black haw, that I think, yeah. Nanny berry. Okay. And just make sure you check the exposure because they are pretty sensitive to that. Yeah. Yeah, it's any other questions? Um, I see one here that came to me directly. It's about how to deal with handling nesting birds near milkweed who seem to consider the monarch caterpillar as their buffet board. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I told you it's the food web. Yeah. yeah, truly. If you didn't want the nest there, you should have got it right at the beginning when they were first building it. Mm -hmm. Once they have babies, the rule is leave it alone. I don't see any more questions. If anybody wants to save the uh, chat with the links that we put in there, you can click on the three dots to save the chat. And Christina from our office will be sending out the links, Leslie's links in her evaluation email. And anybody have any more questions? It's a very short evaluation. If you could please take time to do it, it helps us a great deal. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Leslie You're welcome. Was, oh, yeah. one more, one more message. Okay. <laughs> Maggie. Scroll down. Oh no, never mind. Good. <laughs> Food web it is. Food web it is. It thank is. you so much. I, I I know. It's hard. <laughs> it really is hard sometimes. But what if someone came and did that? that to us if we were someone's food you know source you won't you won't you wouldn't appreciate it either. no <laughs> i do have one question yes yeah. um so we have a deck and underneath it frequently um robins build nests under there and last year we had a robin build a nest under there and then she had four eggs and we um kind of you know from a distance we're watching her uh, take care of the eggs and then they hatched and she had four cute little tiny babies and then one uh, day during a tremendous rainstorm mm. <clears throat> I went downstairs uh, under the deck to check and see how they were doing and instead of the tiny fledgling birds that had just a few feathers there were four very well developed or maybe it was five actually very well developed other kind of birds <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what was going on they were brown I think they might have been sparrows and then I like cowbirds <laughs> maybe well the next day I went and looked at the nest again and they were gone but there were the four baby robins dead sm like smothered uh -oh. yeah. yeah I don't know what in the world happened but we were all mystified by that <laughs> You know, there are other birds that go in and kill the baby of a nest that has young birds in it and lay their own eggs. Like I said, it's it's hard and in, in that you don't see that nest every day under your deck, it would be hard to really deal with. I know one time yeah, we had something under our deck and I thought it was a bird and it turned out it was a kitten, so I had to, I couldn't get under my deck, so I had to go in the basement, op 
open that window, cut through the screen, remove the kitten. It was, you know, the other thing you might want to consider if they continue nesting on your deck is putting something that they can't get through, something that's smaller maybe. I don't know if that'll help, but it's, nature isn't always pleasant. It's, it's just, I don't know it, but it, that's probably what it is, is that someone went in and decided they're babies. Cause then they know that the mother Robin most of the time will continue to feed whatever birds are in that nest. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we were just curious what in the world had happened. So it's nice to have an answer. Thank you. Yeah. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. We can be reached at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. If you're interested in lawn care, please contact our Best Lawns Coordinator, Natalie Walker at nwalker at pwcgov.org.